and Paul and Ed and Cliff. So let's get into Tetzava. So this week's Torah portion is Tetzava. And uh, we are continuing in our theme of a lot of technical discussions about the Mishkan, about the service in this portable temple that the Jews carried out through the desert. And eventually that was basically converted into the Beit HaMikdash, into the temple in Jerusalem. So this particular parsha of Tetzave is dealing almost exclusively with Kohanim, the priests who were doing the service in the temple how they were selected, the clothing they wore, their inaugural service in the Mishkan. And uh, that's basically the main thing that is, that's being talked about. Now, it's funny, I, I, I've always heard this rabbi joke. It's a very cliche rabbi joke I'm about to throw out there and, and tell you why I thought of it when I saw the Parsha. So the story has it that a man goes to a rabbi and he says, Rabbi... Um, I need your help. And the rabbi says, what can I do for you? He says, I really want to become a Kohen. And the rabbi says, you can't, you can't become a Kohen. It's not something I could just, uh, you know, work out for you. Um, and he persists. And again, and again, he's asking, I really want to be a Kohen. Can you make me a Kohen? How much does it take? How many blessings do I need to say? What kind of prayers do I need to do? And the rabbi is, is very persistent that unfortunately there's nothing he could do to make him a Kohen. And finally, the rabbi turns to him and says, just excuse me asking, why do you want to be a Kohen so badly? And the man says, my father was a Kohen, and my grandfather was a Kohen, and my great-grandfather was a Kohen, so I want to be a Kohen as well. Yeah. So obviously, uh, yeah, this, th this man had a, a little bit of ignorance on how the Kohen process works, because we know that Kohen is, in fact, passed from father to son, father to son, father to son. But I'm here to tell you that that was not always the case because the concept of being a Kohen had to start somewhere. And where it started was in this week's Torah portion. And uh, we start off right away um, that Moshe is instructed to bring on, to create the concept of a Kohen. And that was going to be done through his brother, Aaron, Aaron, and his sons. So I'm going to read just the third, fourth verse in this week's Torah portion, chapter 28, 4, now you bring yourself, bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with you from among the children of Israel, Aaron, uh, Aaron, Nadav, Aviu, Elazar, Isamar, those are the children of Aaron as well. And then we're going to make, we're going to make them Kohanim, we're going to anoint them, they're going to wear the, the garments and the clothing. So Aaron wasn't born a Kohen, and Aaron was Moshe's brother. So if Aaron was born a Kohen to his father, then Moshe would also be a Kohen. So obviously the concept of Kehuna, of being, of being this special kind of priest had to begin somewhere. And it was Aaron who was anointed, his sons were anointed, and then their children for all future eternity would be either born as a Kohen or not born as a Kohen. But in fact, there was a concept of somebody being appointed and anointed as a Kohen who was not born a Kohen. Um, but don't try this at home unless you have a, a Moshe Rabbeinu next to you, in which case you might be able to pull it off. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, Aaron set the stage for all his future descendants, and now they're going to be the Kohen forever. So we need to figure out a, a couple things here. And, and the theme that we're gonna go with again is when we're dealing with matters that are so uh, distant from being relevant to us, uh, even if by chance there is someone here who is a Kohen, uh, it's, the, the Parsha is still hardly practical in our day-to-day -day life because this kind of service in the Mishkan or in the Beis HaMikdash doesn't apply to us. A coin has very limited um, status in this day and age, or actually his status is there, but the service that he could do is very much reduced. So we need to figure out what we can take out of this parsha, how we could enrich our lives, and what kind of lessons can we learn from something that can seem so irrelevant. So the first thing we're going to jump into is why was it that Aaron was selected to be the Cohen? Why wasn't Moshe worthy? Moshe was the worthiest Jew of all time. Why couldn't he take on another hat, another job, and be the Kohen in addition to his regular work leading the Jewish people and doing everything? On the contrary, you might suggest that 
you might suggest that he earned it, you know, for everything he did for the Jewish people, maybe he should have the right to take part in such a, a holy service. So we're going to go with our, one of our favorite old time um, commentators, of course, the Arachayim. And the Arachayim gives a very uh, powerful idea of why, why Moshe wasn't selected. And more than that, why Aaron was selected and Moshe had to be the one Sorry, why Moshe had to be the one who was involved in his in this process of anointing Aaron. So he says as follows: the verse says, "The Ata Hakre Ve'lecha." Again, that's chapter twenty-eight, verse one. And you bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, so that he shall be a kohen to me. Moshe is going through some kind of process where he's taking Aaron and bringing him to Hashem, bringing him to become a kohen. So why does, it, why does the Torah feel a need to emphasize the Atta, Moshe, you're the one who's going to be involved in this process? If Hashem wanted to appoint Aaron to be a Kohen, don't you think Hashem could have approached Aaron on his own? Aaron, it's not like Aaron was never a prophet. Aaron was worthy of being a prophet. And in the future, as Aaron's going through the different services, certainly he had a great relationship with Hashem. What does Hashem have to go to Moshe, the brother, and tell him to do this work of bringing on Aaron. So he explains that originally the kahuna was meant to be Moshe's portion. It was going to be yet another um, act of service of Hashem that Moshe was going to do. However, he lost the right to do that in a sort of punishment from Hashem. And the reason is because he resisted being Hashem's messenger to save the Jewish people. At the original story of the burning bush when Hashem uh, spoke to Moshe for the first time and told him to go save the Jewish people he hesitated and a couple of times he said I'm not worthy maybe somebody else should I have a speech defect I'm not so good and uh, because of that Hashem removed kahuna from him because he hesitated he should not a man of his level should not have hesitated when he was being chosen by Hashem to do such a holy uh, mission for the Jewish people. And that's why it was, it was decided that he would not be the Kohen anymore. So, okay, so that's, so Hashem actually indicated this to Moshe um, back then in, at the story of the burning bush. So he says, for this reason, at the time that Aaron was actually designated as, as a Kohen, Hashem said to Moshe, you, the Atta, and you, meaning you should appoint Aaron as a Kohen, not only because I command you to, but you also on a personal level should bring Aaron near as the Kohen in your place and carry out the matter as if you on your own desired it. Meaning don't make Aaron the Kohen because me, Hashem, is telling you to make Aaron the Kohen. Make Aaron the Kohen because you want to give this uh, holy mission that you were originally entitled to, you should want to give it to him. Why should you want to do this? He says, because if you desire to give Aaron the kahuna, this act of installing Aaron as the Kohen is in place of an offering for you and will atone for you having been brazen faced before Hashem and refusing his command to go to Paro. So it's, the, the full uh, kind of atonement for this sin on Moshe's level of hesitating to fill Hashem's commandment was going to be if Moshe on his own would enthusiastically take part in this mission to appoint Aaron as, as the Kohen instead of him. And he talks about, he goes into a, a, a little bit of a Kabbalistic perspective of this. And he says, when a person sins, there's an aspect of his soul that corresponds to the branch of spirituality in which he had sins, which he becomes, which becomes distanced from its root. But I think just to say that in a very simple way, and I hope I'm understanding this right, when we sin, a part of our soul gets disconnected from Hashem. I think that's just a, a simple way of looking at it. Our neshama is close to Hashem, and when we sin, it becomes a little more distant from Hashem. And, uh, and we want to go ahead and rectify that and reattach our soul in that area. So 
at the time that Aaron was going to be installed as the Kohen, Hashem told him that through this act of being the one to appoint Aaron, your soul is going to become whole again, and you'll and you'll be able to bring an atonement for that sin. But an important aspect of this is that you want it. So he says, the Archaim says, now I finally understand something that's been bothering him. It's fascinating to see what bothered the Archaim. So what bothered him was a Mishnah in Brachos that says, Chayev Adam Levarach al Hara Keshem Shahum Levarach al Atova. A person is obligated to bless Hashem for the good, just as he's obligated to bless Hashem mm-hmm. for the bad. So when we have, when we, uh, I'm sorry, the opposite. A person is obligated to bless Hashem for the bad, just as he blesses Hashem for the good. So it's very easy to, to be happy and praise and bless Hashem for something good that happens, but we should also do that when something bad happens. And he says, it's fascinating. He said, I don't understand this. This idea is distant in my eyes to understand. How could you possibly do that? It's one thing if you want to say you need to come to terms with something that Hashem um, did, or, or you have to accept it. But you want me to praise Hashem for something bad that happened? So he says, now that we understand, based on this context of this idea we just talked about, he says, now we understand, it emerges that the suffering that, that are brought on a person bring near the branches of the soul that had been separated from their re- spiritual roots, reconnecting them. So therefore, when a person suffers, his soul is becoming connected closer to Hashem, and therefore... Mm-hmm. He's, he's having an atonement for things he might have done wrong. And that is the greatest thing that could possibly happen to him. And that's why a person should be thankful to Hashem when something bad happens, because ultimately that's bringing him closer to Hashem. And through these afflictions, this aspect of his neshama that was, that was brought farther away due to his actions is being uh, brought closer again. And he says, V'alzeh yismach leiv hamaschil. And this should bring joy to the heart of any intelligent person, <laughs> that this idea. So what, what does he mean, intelligent people? I mean, I don't think he's trying to insult anybody <laughs> over here. But I think the, the matter, the, really what he maybe he's hinting at, it's not easy to internalize that. It's not easy that when something bad is actually happening to you, for you to be the one to, to go ahead and rejoice, like as if like, oh yeah, no big deal, this is good for me, so I'm gonna rejoice. So I think why he's bringing in the intellect or, or our intelligence is it takes a, a thought process to try to get ourselves to that level. Something bad happens to us, we're not gonna by default just be whistling and thanking Hashem for it. But if we think through these ideas that he talked about, then hopefully we can come to this place where we recognize that what Hashem is doing is for our good and bringing us closer to him. And that could lead us to being more thankful for it. But, um, you know, I do think that's easier, uh, easier said than done and not necessarily an easy task to, to pull off. So Moshe had to go and do the hardest thing in the world. He's taking one of the greatest honors that could possibly be in Judaism. And not only is he going to be okay with not getting this himself, but he's going to go ahead to his brother and anoint him as the one who's going to do that. And that can't be, that can't be easy to do. You know, the, the, what came to mind when I thought of this, when did we have a, a similar time in Jewish history where somebody had to honor somebody else in a place that he wanted to get the honor? I don't know why this triggered in my brain, but in the Purim story, oh, yeah. yeah, in the Purim story, we have Haman and we have Mordechai. And Haman was the second to the king Achashverosh. And Mordechai, there was an incident in the Megillah where Mordechai saved the life of the king Achashverosh. And Achashverosh consulted with Haman, who was his big advisor, but of course, who was the arch enemy of the Jewish people and of Mordechai, who represented the Jewish people. And he asked Haman, what? should we do to reward someone who saved the king's life? And Haman didn't know that it was Mordechai that he was referring to. So what does Haman say? What should you do? You should dress him up in the king's clothing 
and you should put him on the king's white horse and you should parade him around the streets of the capital of Shushan and you should scream in front of the horse. This is the honor that's given to someone who the king wants to you know, recognize for his achievements. And, uh, and the King Ahasuerus said, yes, absolutely. That's an amazing idea. Go ahead and do that for Mordechai the Jew. And now Haman, who was probably always looking at the, you know, at the throne himself as the second to the king, needs to take the king's clothes and put it on his enemy, uh, Mordechai, and then drag him through the streets and, and give him all this recognition. And that was a, a tremendous embarrassment for him that he had to go ahead and do that. So, you know, very different context here. But Moshe had to do his own version of that by giving his brother Aaron to be anointed as the Kohen and helping through this entire process of w- the clothing that the Kohen wore and everything went, that went into that. What do you say, Emily? Can I just ask you, did God say to him, you were supposed to be the Kohen and now you lost it or he never said that? I believe so. Um, let's look at this, Archaim. I think he says what he said at the time. Yeah, he says, I'm going to read for you from the Arachayim. Although Hashem had punished him for this at the burning bush by informing him that he will not receive the kahuna, nevertheless, until he actually received the punishment when the concept of kahuna began, so only then was this um, spiritual atonement, um, did that actually take place. So hang on, they bring a reference here to three. Okay, they, they don't say exactly what he said. But yeah, ap- apparently the Archaim is under the impression that Hashem told Moshe that at the time of the burning bush. But that, that atonement doesn't happen until it's reality. And that can't happen until the concept of kahuna exists. And this is many years after that. Okay, so that's the idea of how Aaron was, was chosen and how Moshe was the one who went ahead and was involved in that process of bringing in Aaron as the acting Cohen, and his children were involved in that. And a lot of the Parsha discusses the unique clothing of the Kohanim. The Kohanim had a very unique wardrobe. So this is the next verse there, that's 28.2. The, and Hashem says to Moshe, V'asisa big You shall make vestments of sanctity for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for splendor. So what the, the, the garments were very unique, very unique robe and uh, the unique pants and this breastplate and the tzitz that went on the head. And there's all kinds of very unique articles of clothing. What was the reason for that? So the Torah says, the, the Torah seems to say why, for honor and for splendor. So what does that mean? What is honor and what is splendor? So there's a, a bunch of commentators that talk about what this really represented. Uh, one of them say that this honor was something that is God-given, like glory or honor is God-given because the Kohen was chosen by Hashem to be the Kohen and splendor is something that is earned by man through his actions. So the Kohen had two unique attributes to him. One is that he was chosen to be a Kohen, but the other one is that he actually earned his right of recognition because he spent his day doing the actual acts of of service in the base of Mikdash. So what did the clothing represent? So there's a dispute amongst Rishonim. The Ramban, uh, Nachmanides, says the clothing resembled the clothing of kings, the clothing of royalty. Now, and, and he says these kinds of articles of clothing are the clothing that were worn by royalty in those days. And the Ramban actually gets uh, very technical about it. He talks about, he goes through each of the articles and talks about how it was commonly worn by people in, of royalty. And by the way, we're not talking about Jewish royalty because Jewish royalty did not exist. The whole concept of a Jewish king didn't happen until we had a, a Jewish country, till we conquered the land of Israel. So this is prior to that. But... The Ramban says 
that it resembled the kings of the nations of the world. He talks about how the robe, that it was common for a king to wear a robe, and one of the articles of clothing for the Cohen was a robe. He talks about the turban, which was also commonly worn. He talks about the tzitz, which was like in place of a crown. He goes through all of them, and he, and he talks about how, how that was actually the practice. The Ibn Ezra says it has nothing to do with what kings wore, but rather the point of it was very simple, that it was a unique article of clothing that nobody else wore. That was the point. The point was to make the Cohen stand out as a distinguished and unique individual. So other people did not wear this unique combination of clothing and that's what made the Cohen so unique. Now, it made an, an impression on him. I, I would say there's two people who were impacted by the clothing of the Cohen. One is the people who saw him would see him as someone who is dressed royally and, and give him the kavod and respect for the position that he held. But the other one is him himself. And imagine what kind of process had to go into the morning rituals, getting dressed as a Kohen was not just a matter of throwing on clothing. His clothing were an integral part of his service. If they were made differently or worn differently, it actually disqualified the service that he did in the Beis HaMikdash that day. So it was a very careful process of getting dressed. And I think that for sure had an impact on the mindset of the Kohen going into the temple. He's getting dressed in a very specific way with very specific clothing. And he realizes that he's preparing himself to go serve the creator of the world. And I, I think it's this just clear intentional act of preparing himself that probably helped his mindset the entire day as he's working in the Beis HaMikdash. Um, you know, I, I think we can probably all relate to the impact that clothing has on our attitudes and how we go about our day as well. If we're doing a mitzvah, if we're doing something and we dress, you know, specifically in honor of the mitzvah that we're doing, then we're likely to feel um, more focused on what we're doing and who we're doing it for than if we just threw on, you know, a t-shirt and jeans and and ran out for it. So I think like somebody, I, I did a dinner here at the Kolo um, a couple of weeks ago and somebody asked me like beforehand, what's the dress code? You know, what do I have to wear? So I answered, I said, there's no dress code. You don't have to wear anything specific. You don't have to wear black and white. You don't have to wear whatever you want to wear is fine. But whatever it is that you're wearing, it should be something that you feel is nice. And I, and I think that's a very important part of it. If you feel that you're dressing yourself nicely, you're gonna have a different perspective of what you're doing in honor of Shabbos. So, everything is all right. One moment. I'll be here with Rabbi Or. So I, I think that preparation aspect is, is part of it as well. And then just how we are going to be focused on our task is going to be impacted by what we're wearing. I, I see, I, I came across a YouTube video um, that I'm going to share with you for a minute. But honestly, you, you don't need a YouTube video for this idea. But it was just interesting to me. I, I enjoy seeing how concepts from the Torah are you know, looked at or discovered and understood by people in, in a secular society as well. So I'm going to show with you a quick video. Like, I don't even know if we'll show the whole thing, but just to give a gist of this idea of what clothing does to us, um, which I think is an important part of the, the lesson over here. So let me share this a second and then we'll be right back and we'll, sh and we'll move on to another idea. Um, Okay, do you see the screen? Yes. Okay. I'm going to play it for a second and somebody tell me if you hear the audio as well. It'd be a form of self expression. I bet you knew that. Did you hear yes. that? Yes. yes, we did. Okay, awesome. So I'm just going to redo that. And what we wear can be a form of self-expression. I bet you knew that. But how much do your clothes reveal about you? A recent study finds that wearing formal clothing can actually enhance your ability to think abstractly. 
Heidi Grant Halverson is a social psychologist and the author of No One Understands You and What to Do About It. <laughs> Heidi joins us once again at the table. So Heidi, I think this mm -hmm. is such a fun topic. You've come up with some really interesting things. When you say formal clothing, you're not talking about tucks and gowns. You're talking no, no. about business attire like what we're wearing. Absolutely. Compared Every to dress down Fridays. Exactly. Compared to the sort of like jeans and t-shirt wear. So what's the relationship? How does it affect well, it's, it's really interesting. What the studies seem to show is that when people wear more formal clothing, they uh, they actually feel more powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually look more powerful to other people, but they feel that largely unconsciously, and it actually causes their brains to um, be in a state where they'll think more abstractly. And what that means is they'll sort of see the big picture, they'll be more creative, they're a little bit better at problem solving. So mm -hmm. for a lot of the kinds of work that some people do, the idea of a casual Friday means maybe giving up some of the creativity and, and insightful thinking that you might otherwise be doing on that Friday. Another uh, interesting part of the study too was the impact of wearing a white doctor's coat. What did right. they find? So again, it shows that, that you know the way that clothing affects us has everything to do with what we feel that clothing means. In that study, which was done at Columbia by a colleague of mine, Adam Galinsky, he, he had people wear white coats and told them either that it was a doctor's coat or that it was a, a painter's smock. Mm. And he found that then when he gave them a chance to perform a task where they had to really notice the tiny details and differences in things, people who were told they were wearing a doctor's coat performed much better because we associate critical thinking and attention to detail with being a doctor, but not necessarily with being a painter. Mm -hmm. So it's all about what you think your clothing means. That's how it affects you. So Steve Jobs mm -hmm. had a work uniform, which was the, right. the black That's sweater, right? And then we know um, entrepreneur Elizabeth Holmes, who is the youngest billionaire in the world, also has this work outfit. Yeah. Same thing almost every day. Is that a good idea? I think it really can be. Uh, what we do know is that decision making in general, right, deciding what to wear, or deciding what to eat, it really is costly. It's a yeah. kind of a, the part of the brain that engages in decision making is sort of an energy hog and it makes yeah. you really tired. So, so whatever you can cut down on the decisions you make, whether it's in what you're eating or what you're wearing, you're saving that energy for more important decisions. President Obama told Michael Lewis. Yes, in absolutely. In yeah. a famous article that he had limited the choices he had to make by, in clothes by wearing right. essentially the same suit, same white shirt, same Kind of and when you decide, make decisions all day, it really is important to think about how you can simplify. It doesn't mean you have to be Steve Jobs and wear exactly <laughs> the same outfit every single day. Okay. Okay. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I, I thought yeah. it was also an interesting point about having less decisions to make as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mm -hmm. could definitely relate to the convenience of that. Like as a rabbi, my dress code is super boring. It's basically the same idea every day. So this is pretty much the extent of my decision-making process, which is hard enough as it is. But uh, <laughs> other than that, it's just a matter of which white shirt am I going to wear and which black or dark gray pants am I going to wear? And uh, it's very convenient, <laughs> that's for sure. But, you know, I was thinking about when do I have a time that I truly feel my clothing impacted my perspective and I think, you know, just think about the biggest extreme for me. When do I dress up more than anything else? And the answer to that, you know, is probably a wedding, let's say. A wedding, maybe a sibling's wedding or my own wedding. Let's say my own wedding, for, you know, for sure. So if I'm going to a wedding where I really, you know, I'm going and I want to make sure to be dressed up and the, I'm going to put more careful thought process into that, I'm going to make sure my suit is freshly pressed or freshly dry cleaned and you know fresh newer clean clothing and polished shoes and then try to think of how did I feel once I put that all on I felt pretty awesome the Cohen did this every single day that was the Cohen's mission he woke up and he and in the morning and he had a very careful process of selecting perfectly clean and pressed and beautiful clothing that you know make an impact and I think he was able to feel that kind of um, sense of importance of what he was doing every single day, because that was part of his mission as a Cohen to, to get into this every single day. Um, okay, so we have a few more minutes. I want to get into one more idea, and that is actually interesting. This is the next verse. We, we don't usually go every all the verses in a row. We usually skip around, but this happens to be right in order. So right after... Um, Moshe is told to make the clothing for Aaron. We are in chapter 28, verse 3. 
Asher milesiv ruach chachma v'asu is big day aron lekadsha lechahana li. You shall speak to every wise-hearted person whom I have filled with a spirit of wisdom, and they shall make the vestments of Aaron to sanctify him, to minister to me. So Moshe's job was not to make the clothing, okay? Moshe was a leader. A leader's job is not to do everything that he possibly could. It's to do what he would be good at and delegate to others what he would not be good at and what others would be good at. So Moshe's job wasn't to go to school and learn how to create beautiful fabrics and create clothing. Rather, he found the professionals out there. So he found the people, and it's so interesting how these people are called. They, they're not called professionals, they're called professionals who were gifted by God himself with this unique ability. <laughs> to every wise-hearted person whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. Meaning to say, I think, it's no coincidence that there are professionals out there that have various skills and interests and things that they're good at and things that they contribute to society. It's not like a person goes through life and just randomly, you know, will pick a profession out of the hat and say, okay, I'm gonna become a doctor, a painter, a lawyer, or uh, whatever it is. What a person does with his life is acting on a special gift that Hashem has given him. Hashem filled him with a spirit of wisdom when it comes to any particular area. And that's not a mistake. Hashem is saying Tell, to Moshe, go find those people who I've gifted and have them come use their gifts in service of Hashem by being the one who's going to come and create all these clothing and be able to enable the Kohen to, to do what he needs to do. So I think, you know, there's a couple of things we're taking out of this, but one idea is that everybody's skill matters. Everybody's skill is needed to be contributed when you have, you know, a society as big as the Jewish people, which needs so many different aspects in order for us to run smoothly in service of Hashem. We spoke last week about how we need to fulfill the Torah collectively as a Jewish people. And no individual has the right or even the ability to do every mitzvah on his own. It takes everybody together. So it takes everybody contributing the skills that they have to be able to have us as a Jewish people to serve Hashem the way that we're supposed to. And the other thing I think we take out of the air is we see the gifts that Hashem has given us. And you know, sometimes we might be tempted to separate the gifts we have and the talents we have, which we use in our, in our life, in our profession, that's how we make an income perhaps, with our service of Hashem. So this is my nine to five job. I do this, I'm a doctor. And how am I gonna serve Hashem? Well, I'm gonna try to, you know, dive in and I'll try to learn Torah and all kinds of things that I could try to do. I do mitzvahs and Shabbos, et cetera, et cetera. But really the profession that we, that we have, the gift that we were given has the ability to be channeled into service of Hashem. And I think that's like the ultimate act of serving Hashem is taking the talents that he gave us and using it to help others in a, in a good way or in a spiritual way. Like that's the ultimate level of what we could do. And perhaps we'll learn that our talents are no coincidence. Our talents can be used to help other people and can contribute to everybody being able to grow and connect to Hashem on another level. So our question for ourselves is, what is my talent? What do I enjoy doing? What, and by the way, your talent doesn't necessarily mean what you do best. It might also be what you enjoy doing. Perhaps there's something you enjoy doing that you don't even do so much. It's not your profession. Your nine to five job, you consider a boring job to get bread on the table, but you have some other talent or interest. So perhaps those could be used to help other people or help you or other people connect to Hashem as well. And I think we can, you know, we can think about how can my skill help other people and how, how can I go about doing that? So just some uh, food for thought there, I'm thinking from, from these sucking from these ideas. Okay, so that's, that's all for today. The rest of the, the Torah portion goes through more technicalities of how these clothing were designed um, and uh, feel free to read through it. But uh, for me, the, the theme of Torah talk for these next couple of weeks as well is gonna be trying to highlight lessons that we could take out of this whole technical um, 
details that are just put in here, chapter upon chapter of technicalities. Mm -hmm. What can we take out of it? What can we walk home with? How could we enrich our Jewish lives? Okay, any questions, comments, thoughts on that?